Like I said, this is from the 2011 paper. So we're going back 10 years. Um, unlike uh, some of the other topics, like say vectors and proof, which are newer to the extension two course, um, mechanics and particularly this kind of mechanics question has been in the course for a very long time. So um, fun fact, if you went and downloaded the HSC paper for this, you might've noticed that it's from a time before NESA was called NESA. Um, we used to call it the Board of Studies or the Board for, um, for short. Um, and there were some great, there were some great puns on that because people were like, oh, I'm so bored of studies. Anyway, that's, um, that's a by the by. What do I like about this question and what do I think is worth having a look at? Okay. Well, um, fact one, which you don't need me to tell you because, uh, it's a common characteristic of pretty much all the HSC questions we have a go at. This question was not done very well <laughs> across the state. Um, particularly in this last part, uh, about 15% of the state got part three there, which I think you'll find surprising. When we get to the solution and you have a look at it, you're like, yeah, it's not that bad. Really? Three whole marks worth of um, effort for this? Uh, I think a lot of people, as you've seen frequently, get intimidated by this question and see like, whoa, there's so much here. It's one of those whole pages, um, as I often call them. But if you can see through um, this sort of abundance of, of details, some of which are, are less relevant than others, um, I think you'll find the actual working and the thinking and the concept behind this really quite manageable. Okay, so that's the first thing that it's, it was something that wasn't done well, even though there's no reason for that, I don't think. By the way, if you're wondering, 2011 question 6a, you're like, question six, isn't that multiple choice? Uh, I said this was going a while back. This is before there was multiple choice in the extension to paper. So um, back in these days, yeah, it was, this is actually fairly middling of the road. Um, there were, you know, eight questions as a whole. And so this was like, this was, this was less of a, oh no, I've run out of time uh, question. Um, students were really quite troubled by it uh, and didn't know what to do. So that's the first major thing. The second thing to notice is that um, this is a question that I think does a really great, good job of using terminal velocity, which you can see part one is to work out terminal velocity and that's quite a straightforward result. That's why there's only one mark on it. There's only a handful of very, very brief lines of working, which I will show you shortly. Um, terminal velocity, pardon the pun, is usually where the question ends. You're like, okay, do all of this stuff and then tell me terminal velocity. And it doesn't usually go anywhere because like, what do you use that for? But if you have even just a cursory look at parts two and three, show you that part one working out terminal velocity is not a coincidence. They want you to use, look at how many times um, VT, which is their, their um, designation for the terminal velocity, look how many times it appears in parts two and three. Um, I count one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven, eight times throughout those, those two parts there at the end of the question. So you're clearly gonna need to use that result in part one um, quite substantially in parts two and three. So I, I really like that. So let me just give you, um, before I send you off to work on this independently, I mean, you're probably sort of already doing that in the background. Uh, let me give you one more sort of overview and as promised, a nudge into the question. You've got two people who are jumping out of an airplane with parachutes, thankfully. You've got Jack and Jill, see what they did there. Um, you only get introduced to Jack in the beginning, Jill comes in in part three. But the whole idea is you get given a fairly classic um, vertical resisted motion situation, right? They're jumping out, they pull their parachute, and so you've got gravity pulling them downwards, but then you've got this parachute pushing up against them, um, and it's got this uh, kV squared, it's a quadratic drag situation. So that's gonna be important for when we put together our equations of motion, one of which they've given to us. It says, uh, Jack's equation of motion with the parachute open is, here it is. It says, do not prove this. Though I should point out, um, even though they've said don't prove it, it's not that big a deal. Can you see where it's come from? Um, force equals mass times acceleration. And you can see it right there in the left-hand side. There's mass times acceleration. This is just one of the classic forms for um, you know acceleration alongside x double dot, d half v squared on dx, etc. okay? So you've got force on the left-hand side and then here's the two forces, like I mentioned, gravity and then um, drag uh, due to air resistance, okay? We're not gonna prove that. We're just gonna use that as a starting point. See Daisy, let's click off of that. There we go. So from that, uh, it says explain why Jack's terminal velocity VT is given by um, that square root of mg on k. So I think you guys can get that and only take a few lines. My nudge into this question is just for part two. 
when you have a look at part two, uh, it says by integrating the equation of motion. So they give you a big fat, like go in this direction, okay? Um, they don't leave it up to chance and they've even chosen, they've even designated the form for acceleration, which is often a classic part of the question, like tell me which form is the most appropriate, right? They've already done that out of the gate by um, telling us Jack's equation of motion in this particular format. You don't have to do anything particularly um, dramatic to it. But this equation here, t equals etc, 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 it just looks weird, right? You're like, what's going on here? Um, the appearance of um, not only the terminal velocity, but the initial velocity, um, v0, um, we're just, this is a kind of strange way to phrase the result, okay? So my clue for you is to say, knowing that as in all proof questions, you always have one eye on where you're headed and then another eye on your present working. You clearly need to bring terminal velocity and um, your initial velocity into this equation relating T and V, okay? Um, so you can see them there. And I also want you to notice what's not there. There's a bunch of um, pronumerals that do not appear in this part two result that we're required to prove. So whatever results and whatever pronumerals are not there, if they appear in your integration, you're gonna need to do something to eliminate them or substitute to get them away, okay? So that is enough clues. Hopefully, hopefully it's enough to, um, to get you there. It's 7.43, uh, 44 rather. So I'm gonna give you till, let's call it 7.52, but I would love you to post in the chat as you make progress. Uh, maybe you might say, Mr. Wu, I'm ready to go. Let's, or, or you know, I'm, um, I've got a solution or I feel like I've, I've gone as far as I can and I'm just hitting my head against the brick wall. I'm not making progress. Either way, um, and I'll, I'll Get, I'll, I'll sort of prompt you um, when we get close to that to give me a sense of whether you need uh, more time or not, okay? So I'm gonna turn my mic off, good luck, and uh, we'll come back together in a few minutes. Um, Here's what I'm gonna do. It sounds like everyone's at a different spot, which is, which is good. Um, some of you have noticed that part two actually is harder than part three in a variety of ways. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you um, why I think that is the case. Um, it made me a little perplexed, like when I looked at the, um, the marking scheme for part three, I, I said, I registered surprise that there were three marks assigned to this, um, but I'll, I'll make an argument for that, for that in a second, okay? So let's have a go through. We'll begin with part one, which I think was fairly uncontroversial, um, and then we'll get stuck into this, this troublesome part two that people are experiencing. So just to review, we've got this uh, equation of motion that's been handed to us, um, force on the left hand side, mass times acceleration, and then you've got your um, two vertical components, one going up, one going down, noticing that they've defined for us, VT is positive in the downwards direction, and so that's why gravity is positive, and this resistive force is negative, which is, which is going up, okay? Explain why Jack's terminal velocity, VT, is given by square root of mg on k. Now, um, do be careful. Usually when you see an explain question, um, it is almost a guarantee that you have to use some kind of verbal argument. That's kind of what explanation often entails. I think this is one of the few circumstances where you can pretty much get away with some um, well set out, clearly communicated algebra. So here's the way I'm going to do it. We're trying to explain what terminal velocity is, right? And use as little effort as I can. So the whole idea is that your velocity approaches terminal velocity. So I would say that V approaches VT under what condition? Like what is the most useful way to say it? And I would say based on the equation of motion, um, when your acceleration here, dV on dt, when that's going towards zero, like the whole idea of terminal velocity is once you get there, I mean, you can't physically get there um, in a theoretical situation because you're always approaching, but never quite getting there. But the whole idea is that your acceleration is getting closer and closer to zero. Your, your um, velocity is no longer changing very much. That's the whole idea of terminal velocity. It's where you terminate. So therefore, I'm going to say this, um, this limit happens as dv on dt acceleration approaches zero. And all I'm going to do is take both of those ideas and sort of substitute them into, there's no obstacle or division by zero or anything like that, um, by, for substituting them into that equation of motion that's provided. So I've got m times dv dt on the left hand side, which in this case I'm regarding it as zero. And that's equal to, um, on the right hand side, I've got my gravity force. And then I would normally say kV squared, but here I'm now saying, well, if I've gotten to this place, this mythical theoretical place where my acceleration is zero, then I won't have kV squared, I'll have k of vt squared. 
Right? Does that make sense? And, and then there's really not much more to getting, I mean, you can see the result that's required to prove is VT as a subject. So I just need to do some very basic rearrangement. Um, I will add um, the KVT squared to both sides. That left-hand side is zero because M times zero. You just get that MG on the right. I'll divide through by K which gives me the mg on k which you can see appearing in that result. Now I just need to take the square root, yes? So I'll say vt is equal to that square root right there. And um, I mean, I've gotten so far without using uh, any words except the word as. Um, so here it probably does warrant saying that here velocity, uh, I'm taking the positive for vt because um, I'm assuming, you know, uh, the resistance is never going to be enough to push them like to be flying like actually upwards. They'll slow down going downwards, but they'll never be going upwards. So that's why my V, which downwards is defined as positive, gives me that, okay? So there's part one. Like I said, probably didn't need that much explanation, but at least we're all on the same page. And I hope um, if your notation was a little bit different, um, you can see how mine uh, hopefully makes it clear. We will return to this result. We're gonna need it to use it a fair bit for parts two and three.